progress. I'm Gotham Mukunda. Tonight on Greater Boston, two pedestrians have been killed by trucks in the last two weeks. Is the city doing enough to keep people safe? Plus, years out from pandemic lockdowns, many Boston companies are eager to get their employees back in the office. But many workers aren't ready to give up remote work. Should employers force them back? Today, a man was hit and killed by a cement truck on a road under I-93 in South Boston, just over a week after a four-year-old girl was killed by a pickup truck outside the Children's Museum in Boston's Fort Point neighborhood. And in February, two men, one on a moped, were hit and killed just hours apart in Roxbury and Roslindale. Across Massachusetts, pedestrians have been killed by trucks and cars at alarming rates. Seventy people died last year alone. So why do we see so many pedestrian deaths? And what can we do about it? I'm joined now by Boston's Chief of Streets, Yasha Franklin Hodge, the Program and Policy Coordinator for the nonprofit Livable Streets, Catherine Gleason, and GBH News' Transportation Net reporter, Bob C. Yasha, what's going on? What are, what, is, what are the steps that the city is taking to improve pedestrian safety? Yeah, so the city's been uh, invested for many years in uh, a what we call a Vision Zero program, really trying to end deaths and serious injuries on city roadways through uh, changes to the design of our streets, uh, adding improvements that help uh, pedestrians cross safe, safely, uh, safe bicycle infrastructure, changes that slow down speeding drivers so that there are fewer deaths and collisions um, among motorists. And these changes can sometimes take time to do across a, a city as big as Boston, but our approach has been to methodically change our infrastructure to reduce the places where people are at the highest risk. Unfortunately, there are still too many people, uh, thousands a year, uh, who are injured on city streets and uh, typically on an average year about a dozen who are killed, and we know we have more work to do to really bring those numbers down. Catherine, how does Boston compare to the rest of the country? Right. Well, so looking at the rest of the country, Boston does tend to be um, doing better in terms of reducing pedestrian crashes than even the rest of Massachusetts. Um, but of course, at the same time, especially, you know, in a moment like this where we're reacting to the tragic death of a four year old girl, um, it's, of course, hard, hard to think about how how well Boston is doing at reducing those crashes when, of course, they are still happening and um, they're people's lives. Bob, we just had this horrible incident from a few days ago. Do we have a sense as to what the sort of what the failures are that's causing this to happen, and what what how how they're addressed by the programs that are being well, laid out? Yeah, we don't have an actual cause. It's still under investigation, but there are what you could call contributing factors, and I think one of them is uh, speed and visibility, and uh, these are two issues that I know the city is is addressing. Um, but it seems like a lot of these things happen when, you know, people are driving, they can be distracted. There's a lot to look at when you're driving through the city. And being conscious of being able to see everything that's going on is important. And I know, Yasha, the city has done, uh, taken some steps to improve the visibility, particularly at that intersection. Yeah, I mean, the city and you know, myself and so many members of my team are absolutely heartbroken at the death of uh, young Gracie uh, on a city street. And I think, you know, this uh, it should never take a circumstance like this to bring change. But we know in the aftermath of something like this, we put all the resources that we can at this location, looking at all of the factors that could potentially contribute to a crash here. And some of the changes we've already made, as Bob mentioned, there's a lot of emphasis on speed and visibility when we think about any kind of traffic safety. So we've added what we call daylighting, where we block uh, a parking space uh, on the corner uh, at the crosswalk approaching the children's exam to make sure that turning cars can see pedestrians who may be waiting to cross. Uh, that also slows down cars on that turn. Uh, we've also last night restriped every crosswalk in the area surrounding the Children's Museum and Martins Park to make sure those markings are bright and reflective. Uh, we have some other short-term changes planned, but the big picture here is that we've been working for a number of years to reconstruct all of the streets, all of the streets in this area, Congress Street, Sleeper Street, A Street, with safety as the emphasis. And this project is a, it's a major reconstruction and it takes a while to plan, but 
Um, we expect it to go out to bid this year and begin construction next year. It'll be about a $9 million project. And it's going to bring some real robust constructed safety improvements like raised crosswalks and protected bike lanes that we know are going to make these streets safer for everyone. So nationwide, the Governor's Highway Safety Association data that says for pedestrian fatalities in the United States, for we're looking at from January to June in 2019 to 2023, we see this is a problem that's getting worse, right? It was just under 3,000 in 2019, 2,951. By 2023, it's up to 3,373. Mm -hmm. So nationwide, this is a, like the country is getting worse in terms of pedestrian fatalities. Mm -hmm. um, Boston's doing better than that, right? In 2022, it was 12, mm -hmm. and in 2023, it's seven. And I know, you know, sort of from the way that I personally cross the street in Boston, I'm amazed the numbers aren't higher than that because I, I, I'm sort of the problem, the index case of someone mm -hmm. who does not pay attention. I know that. So what would you like to see the city do? What are the steps you'd like to see it take mm -hmm. in order to get these numbers down, as, as Yasha said, to vision zero? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, the the progress that the city has made so far in, and the... Uh, you know, urgency with which they have um, addressed a lot of the safety issues at the site of this um, awful crash um, is, you know, incredibly encouraging to see. And, you know, of course, knowing that um, construction and, and, you know, more um, actually changing of the changing the streets takes longer. Um, so we're certainly encouraged by that. Um, I think something else with respect to, to this crash that you know, the city has um, less control over is um, really the issue, and I think part of the reason why um, pedestrian crashes are on the rise nationally is with respect to um, the increasing size and weight of vehicles. Um, and you know, recent studies have shown that um, these sorts of vehicles like SUVs or pickup trucks, um, which was what the driver was um, operating um, in, in this crash in particular. Um, we know that, you know, visibility isn't as good. Um, it's, it's harder to see people who are um, maybe walking or biking on the road. Um, and, and also just the, you know, the size and the weight um, means that there's a greater chance of traumatic injury um, or or fatality when um, when struck by these vehicles. So, so the normal story about what well, people often say about why they like to drive in these very large mm -hmm. vehicles is that they're sa they're safer and right. they feel safer. But strikingly, when you look at the death rate, sort of this is not for pedestrians, but for people actually in cars. The United States, which you know has these enormous cars, these yank tanks, as they're mm -hmm. called in Europe. Um, just by comparison, the U.S. roads are actually much less safe than mm -hmm. other countries. So Sweden, the death rate per 100,000 people is 2.2. In the United States, it's 11.1. Mm -hmm. It's actually more than five times as high. Um, so I wonder, Bob, can you help us out? Like, what are the driving factors behind making traffic in the United States just so much less safe than the rest of the developed world? And what are the obstacles to improving that situation? Well, I think that the one common complaint you hear most often is speed. People are speeding down these streets. Some of the people at Sleeper and Congress Street said there's drag racing going on. And I'd like to ask Yasha, what are the, you know, the ways that the city is looking at to curb speed? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think, you know, these factors about changing vehicle weights, changing, um, you know, uh, changing behaviors, frankly, with drivers, we do see more speeding, we see more aggressive behaviors, we see less willingness to yield to pedestrians. I was out this morning at the corner of Congress and Sleeper looking at some of the changes that we put in yesterday. And, you know, just watching drivers kind of bully their way into a crosswalk where people were waiting to cross, it's sort of heart stopping to think that this is happening less, you know, less than two weeks after a child was killed here. And you watch this kind of behavior right in front of a memorial for somebody who was killed. You know, there's an element of this that relates to enforcement and establishing, you know, better and safer norms for how people operate vehicles, especially heavy vehicles in city streets. Um, there is also a lot that we can do from a design perspective. We announced last year a safety surge program that is uh, going to eventually bring speed humps to every residential street in Boston. Uh, we're planning to do at least 500 speed humps a year. And this recognizes that not only are people driving faster, not only are those vehicles heavier, but with the rise of navigation apps, people are being routed into neighborhoods where maybe you know 10 years ago they would have stayed on the main street. Now they're treating a neighborhood street as a cut through to save two minutes on their drive uh, to work in the morning. And so using things like 
widespread deployment of speed humps, I think, is one of the tools that we can use and deploy relatively quickly. We're also making changes at our signalized intersections. We're reconfiguring the geometry of individual intersections to slow people down on turns and improve visibility. So all of these things together, um, it's part of a system. And while we can't regulate the size of vehicles, we can help reduce the chance that big vehicles are going to contact the pedestrian in a crash and hopefully save some lives as we do it. Yasha, is there also sort of a, are you working with the Boston police about traffic enforcement where traffic law is in the city? We are. I mean, I think, you know, the the in, enforcement is always tricky, right? Because you cannot be everywhere all the time. And um, enforcement comes with other consequences and impacts um, for society. And so I think we, you know, certainly want to make sure that our traffic laws are treated seriously by people who drive on our streets. And police enforcement is a part of that. Um, we also believe that automated enforcement using cameras, this has been shown to have proven safety benefits in other municipalities that have deployed it. Right now, Massachusetts law does not allow us to deploy them here in the state, and we would like the ability to do that in select locations where we know that there is a big safety benefit to be had near a school, for example, or in other safety-sensitive locations where the history of, of crashes. Uh, so we hope to partner with the state legislature in the years ahead to change the law to allow us to do more of that automated enforcement as well. Catherine, what's the, what's the most important thing that we could do to improve pedestrian and traffic safety in general in, this, in Boston that we're not doing right now? Yeah, well, I think to, um, to Yasha's point, I think the most important thing at the end of the day to improve safety for people walking, for people biking, and also for people driving um, is, you know, really to focus on how our streets are engineered and how, what the, inter what the conflict points um, are between um, folks who are crossing the street, folks who are biking, um, and folks who are driving. Um, and I think that is like the most, most important way that we can um, really be making not just people safer on our streets, but also making everybody's experience as they navigate the streets um, better. Okay. So Yasha had to drop out early, but we thank him for joining us today. Catherine, Bob, same with you. I think this is an issue that touches the lives of every person in Boston, so we're going to be checking into it all, pretty, pretty often from now on. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Next. Years after lockdowns forced most people to stay home, many workers are holding on to the remote work lifestyle. But many employers are itching to bring their employees back in person more often, as many office buildings sit empty. A concern for both companies and city budgets, which rely heavily on tax revenue from those buildings. Can workers be persuaded to ditch their home offices and lapdogs? Or is this the new normal? I'm joined by Raj Chowdhury, Associate Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School, who studies the effects of remote work, and Jim Rooney, CEO of Greater Boston's Chamber of Commerce. Raj, help me frame this discussion. Why are so many offices mandating the return to work? So I guess partly because uh, old habits die hard, but I would uh, you know, just remind uh, business leaders that there's a very strong reason flexible work is sticking, and that is because this is a talent strategy. So if any organization wants to keep attracting and retaining high quality, diverse talent, this has to be permanent. So Jim, so far, how much of that return to office has actually happened? What's happening to the value of, real, of office real estate in Boston that what might tell us how many people are actually using the offices they used to come into every day? Well, the value of buildings as measured by the, the transfer of those buildings in recent years has gone down. Um, that's clear. From an occupancy perspective, uh, we've got about a 17% occupancy rate, not least in downtown Boston. And uh, on any given week, um, there's about 65% uh, of the people actually coming into the, into the workplace. But as you suggest, employers are trying to require more time uh, in the office and actually implementing ways to try to enforce that. So Raj, is there an argument for this time in the office, for the time in the office that it might see be more important than you might first say? My, my wife observes that when people she hires, if they haven't spent time in the office, they've sort of missed out on the mentorship opportunities that they would normally have had. So it's sort of a common observation that people who are in, uh, very early in their career can be actually years behind they would be expected to be because they missed out on that. Yeah, so two points here. So there's no denying that we need in-person time. 
But the scientific evidence that's emerging, including a study that we published, uh, which is an experiment we ran over nine weeks, uh, suggests that about 25% to 40% of the days should be in person. Now, we need more experiments like that. And I think the truth is that, you know, we don't have to be back every day. And the 25% days in our study uh, need not be every week. Uh, so there are many organizations and teams that are meeting for one entire week every month. There's an off-site model that's catching on. Uh, so there are other ways to organize in person. Okay. So, so Jim, if there are so many other ways to do this, why the push to bring people back? I think State Street just announced that they want all of their people back in the office five days a week. Yeah, State Street has moved to um, um, more required days in the office. I think that we need more data than to make conclusions about, you know, the brief period of time we've had since post-pandemic era. Certainly people did merge their personal lives with their work lives in terms of what they would prefer to do. Uh, that being said, I think people experience <coughs> leading uh, teams of work, while it may be all habits die hard, as I suggested, um, you know, they, they understand how to nurture one's career, how to create those mentorship opportunities, how much networking, connecting with each other. And the fact of the matter is that for a long, a long period of time, our business systems, our ways of managing assumed an in-office environment. And there's a number of things going on and the business community will adjust to this over time. Uh, there's this desire on some people's part to work from home, but there's also different ways of getting functions done. There's outsourcing, there's gig economy workers, there's contractors. And the, and the challenge right now, and this will be a big management experiment, I think, for the next five years or so, is how do you manage this remote workforce in combination with what's going on uh, in the workplace? How do you merge the two and how do you do it effectively? Raj, what's the key pieces of advice you'd give to managers for that? And what are the key pieces of advice you'd give to workers who are now dealing with this new partially remote environment? Yeah, so first of all, I would agree with several things that Jim uh, said. Uh, first, we need more data. Uh, it, it is also going to be a lot of bottom-up experimentation. So one advice uh, that you know I give business leaders is that you have some top-down uh, broad policies, like 25% days could be in person, but you give teams the flexibility to experiment. So some teams could find a rhythm of going one day every week. Some other teams could find a different rhythm of going one entire week every month. So let all these experiments happen. Let's learn from the best practices. And the final thing I'll say, Gautam, is that, you know, we all have to have a North Star. And the North Star here is that this is good for companies because it allows companies to attract and retain better quality and diverse talent. So now just follow up on that. One of the issues that it's that's finding its way into the workplaces that are experimenting in that way is the broader issue of fairness that young employees in particular look for. So for example, there are many jobs that have to be done in person. In fact, about 60% of the workforce um, uh, other jobs in America require that they be done in person. So there's a there's a, a, a divide occurring between the can work from home and cannot work from home. And similarly within teams, teams that are given flexibility versus other teams, you know, you get this in the workplace chat about, well, what about us? How come they can do it that way, but we can't? Um, so the practical side of implementing this flexibility is right now a challenge that employers are working through. Uh, can I react to that, Gautam? Please do. So I totally agree with both the points. And the first point is that many of these RTO mandates do not function well because if you say come back three days a week, and if Jim and I are on the same team, and Jim shows up Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I show up Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, then actually we just have a day in common. So I completely agree that the in-person time should be scheduled in a way that the whole team shows up. And that's why I love the offsites, because the offsites, if done intelligently, attract the whole team. On Jim's other point about the blue collar or you know, some, a lot of workers cannot work remotely, there's actually a quiet revolution going on, which is the digital twins revolution. 
so what digi uh, digital twins are is it's a combination of sensors, automation, machine learning, and data on the cloud. And you can run hospitals, oil rigs, uh, factories, supply chain warehouses now remotely. So I, I completely expect the frontiers of remote work to expand into all of these settings, and it's going to become more fair. So, so Jim, I'd also the shift in the workforce is going to have some pretty big implications for Boston as well. So the February, there's a February report by the Boston Policy Institute that said with the value of office space is expected to decline 20 to 30 percent by 2029, and overall commercial real estate prices by 12 to 18 percent, they're estimating that Boston's going to face a cumulative revenue shortfall of like almost as much as one and a half billion dollars over the next five years. And at the same time, as office space goes vacant, so Boston has this crippling housing shortage, and the NBER has said that converting empty offices to housing is financially feasible in Boston, along with New York, SF, San Jose, DC, a few other cities. So what are the prospects of taking advantage of this shift in the workplace to actually try and resolve our housing shortage here and converting some of these buildings into housing? Well, I'm not sure the study that you referred to. I've, I've seen a study that says that given the um, building inventory, office building inventory in Boston, it's incredibly to, difficult to expect that some meaningful amount of it can easily be converted into uh, residential. There's a lot of physical characteristics of office building that don't, <clears throat> don't allow for that. Um, I think I saw numbers down in the eight to 10% for Boston, but you have to be willing to pay the premium cost of of what it takes to do that, whether it's HVAC systems, windows, bathrooms, just practical stuff. Um, so I don't expect a lot of that to happen. There's a building near our office that's converting, but upon looking at it, it was once residential, moved to office, and is now going back to residential. So that kind of makes sense. Um, I know that we'll look at that, but it just seems to me that if, if it penciled out the way people are talking about it, Developers and investors would have done it already or be talking more about doing it. So if that's something we want to do, it's going to take some form of government, municipal, state or federal investment in cities to convert their buildings uh, in the way you're talking about. I don't see the market reacting um, in a big way to conversions. Raj, Jim, uh, I'll only say that my requirement for coming back to the office is that I would be allowed to be, bring my puppies in with me. So you guys need to make dog-friendly offices a requirement for all of your research and all your work going forward. And on that note, I'm sure that we're going to be talking about this more as we reshape the city. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Finally tonight, it's one of the biggest issues driving people to the polls this election cycle. GBH News sat down with a pair of Gen Z voters with opposing views on abortion for our series, Politics IRL. Here's what they had to say. When, you know, we promote abortion, I think, you know, we're promoting a procedure that ends a human life. And for me, that's a sad thing to accept in a society. I oppose abortion in almost any case. I was happy to see Roe v. Wade overturned. I am very pro-abortion, mm -hmm. uh, free and available on demand, mm -hmm. as my mom would always say. If my partner and I got pregnant, I would get an abortion immediately because I don't see myself in a position to have children. I will say, you know, from the get-go, my faith has informed my opinion, but I'm able to argue my pro-life ethic without using God or religion. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that pro-lifers need to focus on. For you, when, when did human rights begin? When you're a human, when you're born? When you're born. So it, I don't see much difference in the development of the child mm. the day before and the day after the birth. I do think that there is a difference in what it means to you know, remove a fetus at those different points. Um, I don't think that anyone is having an abortion at nine months. If you find out at like a couple weeks that the fetus isn't viable, to force a person to go through the rest of pregnancy with that, 
is traumatizing. I think it's interesting when you, you know, you keep using the term fetus. For me, that's just another development of the human life. I think that the, the fetus, the, the pre-born child, is deserving of the rights of protection to, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think abortion denies the child that right to be born and to have a life um, and to live freely. I personally wouldn't compare a fetus to a human child or any, like in this, I, I, I get your argument. Yeah. I just think for me, like the definitions are different. And I think that these laws end up criminalizing women more so. And I think that that outweighs for me, this idea of human rights, especially when you are kind of saying that a, a, a fetus at two weeks deserves the same rights as a person. Do you think there should be any limits on abortion? You know, I think the viability is definitely an important part of it. But at the end of the day, it's the family's choice of what, what happens, you know? And I, I think limiting it in any capacity means that it is harder to make that choice. And I think that's what's most important here. When, you know, we promote abortion, I think, you know, we're promoting a procedure that um, ends a human life. And for me, that, that's, that's a sad thing to accept in a society. You have this pro-life argument of forcing people to give birth against their will, and then, the, the, a lack of support for the state to then take care of those people when they're alive. There's a lot of private organizations that do honestly take care of women when they're in this position. We do need to make sure that the child and his or her mother is taken care of once they're born. I don't think the state should be able to tell me what to do with my body. I think that the government should be able to provide for me, but not tell me what to do. All things considered, I think both of us really coming into this wanting to have like a very civil conversation and just kind of get each other's points of view made the conversation way natural. I would definitely do it again. At the end of the day, I don't think any of my positions were changed at all. I think if uh, the conversation went well today, much better than I was expecting. My perspective has not changed uh, as a result of this discussion, but I do think I've come out of it um, having a friend. That's it for tonight, but come back tomorrow. Worcester's interim police chief is acknowledging his department has harmed communities of color after a city report found huge racial disparities in arrests. How can Worcester right those wrongs? Tomorrow at 7. Thanks for watching. I'm Gotham Mukunda, and good night. Tomorrow, Worcester's interim police chief is acknowledging that his department has harmed communities of color after a city report found huge racial disparities in arrests. How can Worcester right those wrongs? That and more tomorrow at 7.